Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 8 of the Trinisphere Talks. I am Adam the Johnny, joined by my co-host Shannon. The Timmy. What's and up? And These Ryan. are my co-hosts, clearly. I'm Ryan. Oh, Jesus. Spike. Oh, God. Uh, in today's episode, we are going to talk about the nuclear proliferation of EDH, the arms race. Uh, Strap it, boys! <laughs> uh, what the arms race is, how we combat it, and if you should combat it, basically. Embrace it. Embrace it, yeah? Mm-hmm. All right. Maybe. We'll see. It's debatable. Uh, as always, we are brought to you in part by TappedOut.net, the best deck builder in What's the up? internet. Thanks. Representing. Uh, you can also check us out on EDHREC or CommanderCast.com. So, let's get right into it. What is the arms race? So, when we talk about the arms race, we're going to do a little explaining first, and then then we'll discuss it. Uh, when we talk about the arms race, we're talking about the kind of increasing power level over time of a playgroup. If you are playing with random people at LGSs and things like that, you probably don't experience this as much because I don't. I, I think it happens in more nuclear groups. Um, but there are kind of different facets to this. There's monetary optimization. So as people grow up, you know, get out of high school, college, etc., start making more money, they start putting a little bit more money into their decks, uh, being able to afford things that are outside of the two to five dollar price range, and yeah. buying things like mana crypts and stuff like that. That's going to add to it. Uh, the increase in a certain type of card type. So you're likely to see that potentially. So you can see increase in removal or increase in counter spells, um, which I think can can put a or or board wipes, which can put a damper on games. Like yeah. if you're used to just going tokens wide, and all of a sudden everybody's playing ten board wipes, you're probably not going to win those games. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and also, kind of upgrading win conditions. So as people learn from what's going on in the group, like, oh, nobody plays Cross and Grip, okay, I can win through enchantments, you know, and trying to upgrade just the various parts of their decks in order to get there. So, uh, first thing that we're going to talk about regarding that is, should we combat the arms race? Hmm. So... What, what are the, the possible results of the arms race happening? Like, what, what can happen to your group as a, result, as a result of the arms race just going... Rage quit. Rage quit, okay. Absolutely, yeah. Groups can disband <laughs> due to complete huge discrepancies on, yeah. like, monetary investments. Yeah. I see this on Reddit a lot. People are like, man, some people in my group are, like, X, Y, Z, and sometimes the thing is... Sometimes the most popular answer, the top ten most popular answers are, go find a new group. Right. Like, that happens a lot. Yeah. It's yeah. like, there's a lot of people out there who play Magic, and maybe this group isn't for you, then there's tons of different kinds of groups. So, maybe if this group is totally throwing down hundreds and hundreds of dollars in their deck, and you're like, listen guys, I'm in high school, you know, I'm, right, I'm on right. a budget or whatever, or this is not my only hobby kind of thing, um, then maybe that group's not for you. So, there, there's risks if you guys have like a unmitigated arms race of your group kind of falling apart. It's something right. you got to keep an eye on when you are uh, trying this thing out. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing to, to, to keep in mind is that the arms race is really about, you know, one person will kind of up the ante, which, I, I mean, I think that this happened in, in our group. Like, yeah. one, one or more people decided to start buying Abra Duels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that started a little bit of a cascade that lasted for a while for people who had the budget to do so. Uh, I don't think that that was the worst because that didn't really... I don't, I personally, personally, the way that lands and mana bases are these days, I do not think that those make... I don't think they're super necessary. They're not, they're I, just, I, they, don't for your I personally do not think that those cards will make or break a game ever. Yeah. Personally, ever. There's some you're, that... You're most likely correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a, like... Yes. Like, a my new possibility yes, yes. where you're like... Well, well, the fast land didn't do it. Yeah, and I, I guess I take two <laughs> here because I'm using a shock instead of an a right, exactly. Oh, right. I died to right. a lightning bolt. Um, so, so we've had that, but we've also had some players, you know, spend hundreds of dollars on cards. I mean, we have people with Gauntlets of Might and yep. Lion's Eyes. Those do, things. yeah, Lion's Eye, Metal Worker. Those right. really warp the games that they come. Right, out of absolutely. Um, so, so they they can really warp the group now. Now, our group 
is mostly people who are out of college in the workforce have you know old old yeah we're right, old yeah. yeah um so speak for yourself so we have <laughs> young whippersnapper so so i mean we've maybe been able to keep up with the arms race yeah. a little bit differently than than some groups are so so what do you think what what is a possible result of the arms race uh personally uh i think that uh what what, what was an instance you said rage quit i say that we, and okay so i i noticed that if there's uh, so, like something always happens in arms races is that someone buys a card then this person has to go buy two more cards to, to counteract that Sure. Like, like someone sees mana drain, someone goes and buys mana crypt and this or mana, right, you know right. what I'm saying? Like I've always, I have seen people literally retaliate by just spending more money on their decks. Yeah, yeah. I, it, and that's that's when it starts to get real. And it, and it turns into a true arms race. I've just seen right. it escalate to a point where it's like, oh, someone played an Eldrazi Titan, and I watched someone right. literally go drop four hundred dollars on a like a, a TCG card. Right. <laughs> I mean, we we had a player who who was playing Rafik, and it was a very optimized Rafik list. They they mm-hmm. spent a decent amount of money. Uh, optimizing that as, as much as possible uh and i got tired enough of playing it that i literally built a 50 dollars deck that was nothing but enchantment and artifact removal yeah no uh, <laughs> so uh, like, yeah. like that's See, so so yeah. then i could just like no nope, that, that nope, that's not gonna fly too. nope you get <laughs> these people who build like pre sideboarded decks and yeah. like designed to beat your deck because you're you have gotten a little too far ahead, which is a it's kind of a way to, to mitigate that, but it's also a problem. If yeah. you uh especially if you're in your group and you're winning a lot, then other people in your group tend to start building decks that are designed specifically to beat you. Which right. can be unfun. It can kinda of suck. If you if you keep stomping people with the same deck, expect them to start like trying to hit you out. I, I actually personally believe that matchup is way more relevant than price. Yes. I just think it is. I mean it uh, it can be. I, I mean, okay. I think it's. I think it's. It's, it's very specific. Or, I'm sorry. What it's. It's very heavily weighed factor. Because, right. Because uh, a load of the ground token. Or I'm sorry. A load. A load of the. Or a creature deck is never going to be a control deck, in my opinion. Right. Like a, a, a creature oriented deck is gonna, always going to lose to a board wipe deck. Always. Yeah. Unless you got that sweet living end. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I was looking at uh, before the show. I was looking at a friend's deck mm. who who plays in the group. And he has a, a workshop in there that he that he just uh, procured. Yeah. Um, I don't know. A workshop mana crypt start to a uh, colorless deck seems pretty okay. Yeah, that's You're a, probably going to win that game. Split five mana before you play a land? Yeah. yeah. Well, no. When you play a land. Because the workshop's workshop. a land. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I think that there are some positives to it. I think that one positive is that the jank deck, not even cheap, but the jank deck with weak win conditions, not enough card draw, not enough removal, those things will start to lose a lot in the arms race, and you'll at least have to start optimizing your build. Yeah. Now, optimizing your build can be with $1 cards. I mean, you like, don't play bad ramp. Play for a dollar a cultivate, or, yeah. you know, yeah. <clears throat> mind stones, and things like, 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 you can do a lot of cheap optimization to your deck to just make it flow a lot better. Yep, there's yeah. add a lot more card draw, brainstorm. I see, I see this come from spikes a lot. They'll add more interaction, which is something that most people right. don't run at all. And when you start seeing people play these really clutch cards that are super powerful, like a metal worker or something, all of a sudden people are like, well I guess maybe I should start playing Vanda Blast or some ways to deal with these kinds of things earlier on. It starts to actually promote more interaction in your group, yeah. which is really a good thing because Honestly, most groups don't play enough interaction. So then when we, when we talk about what the, what the possible outcomes are, we have to talk about whether or not... Is the arms race a natu- natural evolution of a playgroup? Is it something that is bound to happen given any amount of time in a playgroup without applying restrictions like a 2DH or something like that? Personally, I believe it just happens naturally um, because... Unless the group were to die out, because I believe the longevity of the group has a lot of influence on that as well, because let's say we start a group right today, we just, brand new Magic Collection, right? Sure. Let's say we all start with a pre-con. Right. But we also still play Magic, right? And new sets come out. So yeah. one of us buys a box, or one of us, you know, right. buys a booster pack and cracks like a $40 card, or a really powerful Magic card that can slip right into an EDH deck. Someone sees that and says, wow, I really wish I had one of those. Yeah, I didn't pay 20 bucks for it, I paid 350 for it in the pack, but that arms race just started. Right. Because yeah, fair enough. he may not have paid $35 for that card, but 
that person just got beat by a $35 card. So they may want to combat it. Right. I, I think to a certain extent, uh, some of it is natural. Meaning, if you have players who are trying to win to a certain extent, you know, I, I, yes, think, yes. I think we all play the game for some level of to win. Obviously, some of us care about winning a lot more than others. <laughs> but um, if you're trying to win, then you have to have some way of interacting with other people's win cons. Yeah. So if you're constantly confronted with all these other win conditions that you weren't able to interact with before, then it's only natural for you to start to evolve and say, okay, I keep losing to this. Maybe yes. I need to have answers for this. And so you, you start building those in there. Some of those answers might increase the power level of your deck, which is kind of part of the arms race. And then you also have, once you do that, the person who has been winning is like, you know, I need to step it up and you know maybe not rely on that win condition a lot. And that kind of goes back and forth until you either reach a balance or it hits critical mass. Yeah. <clears throat> Shane, what are, you, what are your thoughts on Yeah, well, I think uh, arms race is a natural uh, occurrence in any group, mainly because we're playing a format where cards never rotate out. So your collection is consistently and constantly growing. Yep. It's always going to add more cards and more cards, and you're going to hit a limit where you're like, I have every card that's decent and kind of a budget Selesnya deck. So where do I go from here? Wait for new stuff to come out, or maybe I start going back and start upgrading my pieces, that kind of thing. Right. Um, also, when it comes to uh, uh, Timmy's, like me, uh, we sometimes see some things that we really want to experiment with. We want to see like a Gristle Brand deck as a commander. That'd be really cool to see that go off one. So occasionally, we're thinking like these decks that we've heard about that are so powerful. We want to see them happen once in a group. So maybe we're gonna go out there and, and try and acquire some of these cards to play it. You know, maybe just like once or, or twice. Just see one of these decks go off and, and blow everyone away, which would be awesome. So, the uh, mitigating factor to all this is obviously whether there's a balance to the arms race. Meaning, is there in your group a balanced level of everybody stepping it up at a similar rate? Because people who aren't, for example, might start to get very frustrated and start to drop off and drop out of the group. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so is it balanced? Should you keep it balanced? Um, you know, et cetera. So, so from my perspective, I think that there, if, if nobody is adapting, like, like, let's say that well, I'm not going to give it to you. Let's nice. say, let's say that Shannon is winning 75% of the you game. Get my sloppy seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, let's say Shannon's winning 75% of the games in our group. Okay? Yes. We know that's not true. Well, you know. You should have given this one. <clears throat> you yes. really should have. <laughs> Crushing it. If he continues to win, regardless of whether he put $10,000 into his deck or not, if he continues to win, I feel like there's some level of a Darwinian theory there. Like, the other people are losing because they are not adapting enough to it. Right. And so, the, that adaptation and that evolution of your playgroup has to happen for the playgroup to stay healthy. Yeah. Regardless of how much money somebody's pumping into it. Again, a Cross and Grip isn't an expensive card. Source the plowshares are cheap these days, right? Still yeah. Oh, yeah. Like oh, they might be cheaper than that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you can get interactive cards that are going to blow up the same $700 card <laughs> as they do a 25 cent card, you know? So, that. So, you're saying get good or die, basically, when it comes to the arms race? I'm saying if, if it's, it's a. Like a spike if, approach. If, well, if it's an <laughs> issue to you, then you should adapt your deck building. I'm rubbing off on him, it's okay. Yeah, get a little too close over there. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> you're, you're, in, you're in the booth while, while well, things get Hey, look, heated. I only run counter spells sometimes because I like my combos to actually hit. Yeah, I, we noticed. We noticed, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and you it's have like, to adapt it's, to it's like It's like, oh, oh man. He's, oh, got, he's got double blue open, but it's my turn, so there's no way he's going to cast that counter spell because he needs it for his turn. Right. Uh, yeah. so, so, I mean, you, you have to 
you have to make an effort to make yeah. yourself win. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's other ways that you can go about uh, mitigating um, all kinds of bad or toxic things that happen to your group. Uh, and the way that I have gone about that somewhat historically is kind of sculpting the social opinion of the group to try and weed out these bad elements. Like we had players in our group that we didn't like that much that, or they did things that we didn't like. And so, you know, you can go about talking to your group, you know, you, oh, well, first of all, you should talk to them. That's the first thing you yeah, should always do. Absolutely. You should always talk to them. Open and, and honest relationships. Yeah, it's the only yeah. way things that work. Is all, that should always be the number one. It's like, oh, so-and-so in my group does X, Y, Z. The number one thing you should do is sit down with them and talk with them. And talk with them as a group. Well, And you can also get a feel for the rest of your group. Are they in the same boat as you? Yeah. Do they also feel the same way as you? Maybe you're the minority. Maybe everyone's on his side. That kind of thing. Maybe you need to you know, reconsider your stance on that. But if you get everyone together and they are saying, hey, this arms race is out of control, then you can sit down as a group and be like, Maybe we need to start like doing like bands and stuff like that because or we so. all feel like yeah. you, ex, you know, you maybe Spike or so, are, are, oh, because you've fine. invested, <laughs> because you because you paid to win, uh, right. you're winning too much and we don't wow. like that. So. I paid to win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Budget challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, well, yeah, that, you, I mean, can use, like, you can use that's like another social way. manipulation. Right. Something. That's another way that you could that you could do it is you could you could impose budgets, which yeah. we've done before and. Uh, in our uh, in our group, they don't usually work out well. No, people usually get really salty about the ineffectiveness of their own deck being on a budget. Yes, because hmm. they built it poorly because <laughs> they're used to pay to win, paying to win. I don't know then. what you're talking about. No, <laughs> <laughs> he is definitely calling someone out, but I don't think it's any of us. Don't worry about it. Uh, all right, so. How to mitigate the arms race, or or slow it, or whatever, and should we? So so let's first just talk. Oh, like, should we ever be stopping the arms race? Personally, I think that making a seven hundred dollar purchase. That's on you. You want to make a seven hundred dollar purchase? Yeah, sure. Play the card. Right. No, that's how I feel. Like I yeah, just yeah. like just like if we can play Lotus, if you want to pay that money for it, play it, please. Right. Like I don't care. Like I mean, yes, the, like that's on the ban list. That was probably a poor example. But if you're gonna shell out any of the money right, right. for a card that is playable in EDH, just go ahead. Bizarre and Baghdad. And yes, go ahead. Just yeah. just, just yeah. play it. Like yeah. I I personally don't think that, that like now if you're a brand new player jumping into say our play group, I would suggest you might want to catch up pretty quick. Well, so so that uh, well that's what I was gonna say. I mean, so like with with our play group. If you have somebody who's only been playing for like two years versus somebody who makes tons of money and, and will will pour that into their deck, that might sour them from playing EDH. Yeah, altogether. absolutely. A hundred percent. Which, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. And it's not on the new player. No, but, uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's not, not even realistically the, the, the old player's fault either. It's not. It's really not. Like, you asked to play DH. I mean, granted, like, I mean, if you were hating the person out, genuinely, then, then you're just well, being, yeah, you're yeah, just being a dickhead. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but if you're genuinely playing the game, and, like, the game ends quickly because of a combo, for instance, that was a symbol on turn four. Right. Like, because your deck functioned better because you had more money into it, that person, no, no one's at fault there. Right. That, that person just learned a lesson, though. Right. So what, what are your thoughts? Should you slow or attempt to mitigate the arms race? I think early on in our group we definitely did that. Yeah. And like uh, we definitely tried to keep it from getting out of hand because not all of us were willing to spend money. And yeah. we thought that when someone did spend money that, you know, the advantage that they gained, which truthfully in hindsight isn't always like you know, un insurmountable. And yeah. like as we come to find, there are many ways to combat it. Yeah. But back then we thought it was insurmountable so we fought it, I think kind of hard initially. Uh, now looking back after playing EDH for many, 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 many years, um, I think it's it's healthy for a group to be able to explore all kinds of parts of EDH and that you shouldn't be imposing restrictions on people unless like, you know, everyone in your group but one person is on a really tight budget. I mean, you should, even then, like, it's, it's tough to tell people that they can't play cards they want to play. That's yeah. a really bad way to go about governing a group. Yeah, I mean, I... I agree with you 100%, but that, that last example that you brought up is is the problem, right? Like, you know, you shouldn't build a play group based around a group's socioeconomic status because that 
it kind of cuts other people out from playing. Yeah. You know? Yes. So, yep. Yep. you know, if you have somebody who's on a tighter budget, uh, allow proxies maybe or something. Let him play on your. Yeah, that, that was that, act, that was actually maybe some... maybe allow proxies. Maybe impose some bans. Maybe. He, wait, he just said let him borrow a deck. Yeah, let him borrow a deck. Yeah, that's a yeah. That's I mean, a very like, good I mean, like, too. I, that was actually I was my next point was to say proxies. Like, yeah. honest to God, if the so if there if the economic status is an issue, and you're jumping into a wealthy pool of players, right, right. if they don't have a problem with it, proxy a deck. Right. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, we I think have, we, we have this misfortune of playing this combination of a competitive game. And a collect- collector's game at the same yeah. time. Yes. So unlike many other games like chess, everyone has the exact same stuff to work with, so it's just pure competition. You have this other factor of collectability that that adds exclusivity. And some of us cling on to that too much. We're like, well, I paid my money. I went out and collected this really expensive card. Sure. I think I should have an advantage over my opponents, but that is not going to breed a good competitive no. group. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, you, I mean, you want to have as much of an inclusive idea as possible. So... <clears throat> if you were to mitigate the arms race, and we talked about some of them real quick, what are some ways that we that we could do that? Uh, you can get away from just like generic ED, vanilla EDHs, I guess we're going to be calling it sure. pretty soon here, <laughs> uh, and go to alternative formats. Like we do... Brawl? No, no oh, brawl. Well, yeah, Brawl is definitely one. <laughs> we can talk about that in a second. We'll talk about yeah. Brawl, the new format, but... <laughs> Before Brawl, there's plenty of other fun things you can do yeah. that don't require you to overspend on standard right. cards. Uh, you can play budget. You can play themed. You can do uh, two at a giant bay stuff. Like into, I love two at a giant because um, it hides the uh, inadequacies of your deck design. Yeah, it does. By, <laughs> it really does. By allowing your teammates like strengths and your strengths to synergize, yeah. you'd be like, "Wow, I forgot to put removal." Oh, but I'm with a control player. We rock that yeah. kind of thing. There's all these different uh, alternative formats that you can play that can. Uh, you know, um, allow you to compete on a much better level against stronger players. It actually really mitigates the whole power creep thing. Well, and I think I think one of the one of the best examples that our group already does, and I think it's the best time for new players to join our group, is every year when the precons come out. Oh yeah, precon league. Yeah, we have a, a league that we do with our play group, and sometimes new players will come in, and that's a great time for them to join. Yeah. Because we're all starting with precons. Yep. Yeah. If you have the what is it, thirty five dollars. $45? Yeah, it's like, like yeah, $40. Yeah, yeah. You know, to, to buy the initial deck, which that's not a huge investment. No, especially seeing the value in those is much more than that. Right, It exceeds, it, it, exceeds yeah. it every year. Yeah, and they're always a good investment. Every week we make five changes, and so you can you can make budget changes, or yes, you can pour tons of money into it, but yeah. I haven't seen the money really decide those games, no, in my opinion. No. People don't even put in lands until pretty much the end. Yeah. They, they stick, with, they stick the with, last, the with the last week. Yeah. yeah in in the, fact, the reason we came up with that design, the whole pre-con league, was that back at the shop that we used to play with with a bunch of people for EDH night, we had a bunch of young kids coming up to us and wanting to play EDH with us, but they were getting blown away or whatever. Right. And they were having trouble with deck design, so we're like, hey, let's sit down, let's create a format where they can hang with us, and also at the same time we can show them how we kind of upgrade our decks, show right. them like the incremental changes that we make to decks better and try and help them like learn a little bit more about magic. And they loved it. And it's yeah. become something that even we love. We do it every year. It's yeah. awesome. Dude. I mean even like even showing them like tips on how to play you know, because there's only four pre cons or whatever that come yeah. out. So you're inevitably going to see the mirror match. Some overlap, like, yeah. Oh that car is real that, way that's, better. That's way that's better than I thought it was. <laughs> you know, and and so people pick up on it. So I, I think it's a great way for newer players to Gain experience for you to avoid yeah. the arms race. Uh, we also have done budget leagues before. Yep. Uh, we've also done other leagues where we set a price. I think the the tribal league that we did, we had a price cap on that too. Hundred fifty. Yeah. Something there. Hundred. Yeah, I don't remember what it was. I think was. it was hundred bucks. I yeah, it might have been a hundred. Because um, without yeah, without that, like fifty would have been way right. too cheap. So so setting price caps on decks or on cards might be a way to do it too. The card thing. Meaning. Is your ban list might just evolve into a, if it costs over $50, that card's banned. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's not something that we've adopted, but if you have somebody who's on a, you know, he's like way price restriction. He's a $1,000 deck and you have a $100, everyone has a $100 deck. Right. Like, come on. Man. I do come want to on. point something out. 
if you guys are listening to this and you happen to not have started your arms race yet, have this conversation now because yeah, oh yeah. you definitely don't want to have the talk with the group member that just bought $200 worth of cards and then tell them that the debt they, they can't is play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they're the first person to pull a trigger that they get punished for your group taking oh, cool. a oh, unanimous cool. vote. All so those cards are now banned. Do, yes, do them, a, like, boop, do them a favor. Like, do them a favor. Do everyone a favor and just stop the arms race now or just go with the flow because right, right, yeah. you don't... Uh, uh, but I, I do think, to a certain degree, there's a level of inevitability to the arms race. Oh, yeah. It's the extent happen. to which it varies by group. You know, one player might be particularly talented, and they just optimize their deck, and that's where, where the arms race starts. I said talented, though. Talented? Yeah. I win every dice roll, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue those stats, man. It's he's, true. I can't, I can't argue that. Undestructible. Talent. Undestructible. Um, or, or it could be monetary. You know, somebody somebody gets a, a big promotion and they're like, well, I'm going to buy all the expensive cards I've always wanted. Yeah. And that kicks off your arms race. Is it, it not important? Or no, you said it was Mishra's Workshop? Yeah. Mishra's Workshop. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. He also cracked a version of board in the back. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's awesome. Good to have <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, those are, you know, some things to consider. And what Ryan said, 100%. Have the conversation as early as possible. You yeah. know, somebody goes out and buys a twenty dollar card, and you're or, or a couple twenty dollar cards, and you're like, okay, so you bought those, awesome. Let's set thirty dollars as our price cap, as our card. Yeah, you know, so you can still play with your stuff, but before anybody invests any more money, before that one yeah butthurt person goes, I'm going to up him, right? And, then it's exactly. up, and you're off to the races, right? Exactly. Now, if the first card they buy happens to be a tabernacle, well, you know, yeah, you're a little yeah. <laughs> That Card conversation price. is way too late, bud. Price like, cap twelve hundred dollars. You good? <laughs> I think it's like yeah, 15, I think uh, is it fifteen. Yeah. Uh, all right, so that is going to wrap it up for us. Uh, so make sure that you like, subscribe on YouTube for notifications Ooh. on more content. Did it? Did it? Ding. Follow on Facebook Ooh. and Twitter, especially during any preview season, because we love some previews. Oh yeah, and we will be. Tweeting and Facebook. Yeah, join us on Facebook. We're going to be talking about all the spoilers. Yeah. Come all at least the, all the EDH applicable ones. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not the, gonna put the, like, this is limited playable, maybe. Yeah, yeah. We're probably not. Don't worry. <laughs> We're, our channel is only going to be filled with Brawl from now on. Wait, did we not talk about that? Should, should we should we mention Brawl? Hey, Brawl exists. Don't play it. It's Tiny League yeah, no, 2.0. Yeah, like you said, 100% don't, don't just... Oh, God. It's a trap! Oh, no, honestly, if you're, I think if newer players want to get into EDH and they end up, it's a good if idea. they end up coming up with a sealed product, that might be a decent way to start into a collection. Hey, what if what if uh, Commander Twenty Eighteen is a uh, brawl themed? <laughs> Sorry, okay, let's continue We've, with the outro, please. Hard, okay. hard pass, hard pass. <laughs> so with that, guys, we will catch you next time. All right, take it Thanks easy. Thanks for joining us. Have a, have a lovely evening. <laughs>